Okay, let's see. Should be there we go. Excellent. You should be able to hear me. Welcome to another Tuesday Tech Talk. Um, kind of wanted to hit a little different angle here. I've been doing a lot of studying for various certifications and so um, and I've also been in conversation and folks thought this is an important topic. OSI model, right? Um, first the normal disclaimers. This basically comes down to nobody's paying me to do this right now. Uh, and if they ever do, I'll let you know. And if I haven't had experience with it, I don't really want to talk about it. Because I don't provide value then. That simple. Uh, OSI model is a conceptual model that characterizes and standardizes the communications functions of a telecommunications or computing system without regard to its underlying internal structure and technology. Why is this that? Why is it even an important concept at all? Well, you got to go back to the early days of DOS, disk operating system, early days of the PC. Every application you bought had to have printer drivers. The operating system didn't provide that abstraction. So, of course, I had this slightly off model. It was a Epson EX1000, remember the thing, right? The FX85, that was what everyone had. I had this different, a little different. It had a color option, dot matrix color. Yeah, there really was one. You know, so I had to look. Um, if I got WordPerfect and did WordPerfect on my Atari Mega 4ST, have drivers for that Epson, okay, or do they have an Epson that's equivalent, right? The abstraction allows intercommunication to different systems, right? We're Unix systems, Macs, PCs, all these things all talk to each other. Um, the OSI model gives us a logical framework to think about and design uh, our communication networks. So that's why this thing has relevance. Um, purposes of understanding the OSI model, right? And ask yourself, do I understand how this layer works? What's it, what's it supposed to do? It's pretty straightforward. Triple constraints, because we're always there. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, basic history, 1983, there was work being from the late 70s by the ISO and the CCITT, Committee Consultative International Telefonique et Telegraphique. Um, emerged into this basic reference model for open systems. And it was published as ISO 7498. And in fact, uh, let's see if I can pop that so you can see it. There's a copy of it. Download it on the web. Um, apparently, I, I sort of missed that. Yeah, there was really like software built off this, but doesn't exist anymore, not used. TCP IP became the standard. Okay, um, and sort of what is it, okay, divided this thing into seven layers. Does it have to be seven layers? No. You, like with anything, you're making these divisions in ways you make sense. You may see later that, hey, we really should have divided this layer into two segments because they seem to do very different things. Sure. And each layer of the seven layers, they interact with each other. So when you talk about the first layer, application and application. So, for example, um, you ever use like TeamViewer or Skype, right? Um, Skype and Skype talk to each other. So how how you're allowed to communicate? What's the security on it? What um, uh, there's a lot of that application layer. They interact directly with each other. Now, it's not. As you go down this model, each layer interacts with that on the other side of the conversation and interacts with the layer above and below. And, that, that, and we're getting to the layers just a second. Um, and of course, this is an abstraction. This is not, um, when you're writing the code, you don't have to go, oh, you know, I've got to block this out. This is layer five. Not exactly. Um, Sort of. <laughs> yeah. So here's the seven layers application. I'm going from seven to one application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical layer. Physical layer is probably the easiest to understand, I think. Some of them get a little more vague, right? And then I'm going to show you a mnemonic. There are lots. You can Google it, right? Just 
I've learned a lot of things through mnemonic. Um, what is it? Every animal can easily walk near India's dunes. That's how you map the log level and um, the name in Cisco, right? So emergency is zero and um, what is it? Alert. Um, uh, uh, that's funny. I'm having trouble doing it and talking. But anyway, same thing. All people seem to need data processors. Like you said, find one that works for you. If this, this doesn't work for me, it doesn't have to work for you. There can be dozens, right? Just so here's a sentence that I can put in my head and, I, and uh, all people. Uh, and if you do network engineering, you tend to be a lot in particularly um, network, data link, and physical layer a lot. Transport, yeah, that one too. Top three, not so much. Maybe that's where you need to have the mnemonic more, right? Some of these things you're going to learn because mm, you do it all the time. Okay. Why do I care? Okay, well, um, a lot of documentation you're going to run into. A lot of discussions are going to talk about in this way. Oh, this is layer three, this is layer two. Right? If you don't understand what they're talking about, um, it, it's harder to ground the conversation. So trying to do some training somewhere and you're reading a white paper or something or other, if you don't understand this, it makes it a little harder to understand what they're talking about, right? Um, it, it also can give you a framework for troubleshooting. Now, TCPIP traditionally didn't map one-to-one. -one. They kind of compressed data link and physical, right? Um, but the concepts always all apply, right? Uh, and if you certify, you'll get it. If you go to certify, you'll get asked OSI model questions, in, particularly in the early stuff. Um, they still kind of do later on, and I, I haven't done my CCIE test yet, so I imagine there'll be something in there. Um, not as much as it used to be when I took the first CCNA test uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, that they, they ask a lot of questions because the test wasn't as broad as the current one. But, you know, if you do CCNT, it's going to be in there. Good to know. Okay. Here's layer seven, application. Uh, application process exchange information by means of application entities. I always love this language. Use application protocols and presentation services. Uh, as the only layer in the reference model that directly provides services to the application process, the application layer ne necessarily provides all OSI services directly usable by application processes. He says, hey, in this stack, I'm going to talk to the applications. Okay. Um, and in addition to information transfer, such facilities may include, but are not limited to, the following. That's great language. Isn't it? Identification of the intended communications partners. Right. So think about it, like um, a web browser, right? Okay. I put in HTTP colon blah, blah, blah slash, slash, Google, right? Dot com. There we go. There's a name. That's what I want to do. Um, maybe I get more specific. Like I can do www.cisco.com slash go slash license. License licensing, whatever. Um, there we go. Um, HTTP, or it says I'm doing hypertext transfer protocol. Um, there's the name. There's I want to go. I'll be more specific to say go licensing so that that's a hit a link that takes me into their licensing portal. Yeah, um, acceptable quality of service, right? So reasonable response time. So you're doing Skype, for example, and Skype gives you the like, eh, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. Um, error rates, um, synchronization of cooperating applications, agreement responsibility for error recovery, um, agreement on security aspects, authentication. Again, thinking of things like uh, web page, um, that it's up this application layer. We're doing that. Uh, are you authorized to access this page? Um, select selection mode of dialogue, identification of abstract syntaxes. I love that, that phrase. If you pull the ISO doc, you can actually look and they'll go through and define these in excruciating detail. But just again, the basic thing about an application like HTTP. You're thinking about something, web browser, you're looking at Skype, you're looking at something like that application layer. And hey, it's called application layer, so that's pretty easy to, to think about. These are the things they're going to ask you about, typically. Um, quality of service, 
who I'm communicating with. Um, and there may be other things in here too, like the application layer are things, um, might include um, uh, file access control, things like that, okay? Presentation, and as an example, I think of ASCII. So presentation layer provides for representation of information that application entities either communicate or refer to in their communication. Presentation that provides for a common representative representation of the data transfer between application entities, the application entities of any concern, with the problem of common representation of information. Presentation layer ensures the information content of the application layer data is preserved during transfer. Uh, cooperate, cooperating application entities are responsible for determining this set of abstract syntaxes. They employ their communication. The presentation layer is informed of the abstract sentences that are to be employed, knowing the set of abstract syntaxes to be used by the, by the application entities. The presentation layer is responsible for selecting mutable, acceptable transfer syntaxes. Let me go and ask you, there's a lot of different ways you can encode the bytes. Right? And particularly if you deal with other languages, where the more complex ones like Japanese, where you've got, you're not dealing with just you know, 26 Roman characters, you've got 50 some on in Kana. Um, and certainly if you talk about kanji, mm -hmm, there's a lot, right? You ever seen Japanese keyboards? They're um, like traditional Japanese typewriters had this enormous uh, set of keys. They had to. Um, so uh, there's different encoding if I'm going to do that. How is this thing uh, encoded? How is it represented? Because of course, when you get down to the bits and bytes, when it comes to the other side, I need to know like this is this is the beginning of a character. This is this is how I get you know the the U with an umlaut on top. You have to agree to that. So that's where presentation is involved with, and I used ASCII as an example, encoding method. Um, and so. In terms of like network, yeah, application, uh, uh, application somewhat. I mean, if someone says, oh, the network's down, well, I can't log into this website. Right, but you can go to other websites, right? You can get to the login page. You just, you're having trouble logging in. It's probably not the network. I mean, it could be if there's some sort of other protocol that's happening underneath it that needs to communicate because it's looking for a token on your system and, you know, the firewall block it. Sure, sure. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But the basic thing is, look, I got the website, but like, I can't remember my password. That's not, not a network problem. And the ASCII piece of it, look, um, the file, you know, made it a – the web page is displaying, right, it's text, but it's in Turkish, and I don't know Turkish. Uh, if it started in Turkish and it's still in Turkish, because it's in Turkish. Okay. Again, that's not a network problem. Um, did the data go from that server to the client cleanly? The answer is yes. The fact that you don't understand Turkish is not my problem as a network engineer. I'm just sorry it isn't. So that's your presentation layer. Um, certainly, this stuff can all come in. I mean, when you look at, when you really get into trouble, you start pulling your packet analyzer, right? You do a span session, you go grab, you grab traffic, you take a look at it, and you start digging into it. Um, if it's like some unknown um, uh, encapsulation, yeah, there you go. There, there's part of the problem. Is it, you know, did it get corrupted somewhere along the way? Is it sent corrupted? Good to know. That's where I want to be able to pull captures off both ends, right? Okay, so if you're like, no, this is clean, come, where to get monitoring in, in transport? And the idea of all this OSI model is that each different layer, so you go back to this application layer, you take that bit of data you want to send over, and then you can put a header and a trailer if you need to, um, to identify, you know, hey, I'm a Word document or, or I'm whatever, a web page, whatever. Um, and then at each layer, you can include some sort of like frame check. You can do some sort of checksum that says, yep, this, if, if you hash this data and then it doesn't come up to this um, uh, hash value, that there's something happened. 
you can do that. And each layer, you would keep adding on top of We add a little more payload, um, a little more the header and footers, headers, um, to just make sure everything worked right. To be, and for each layer to go, OK, this is what you are. So you have to, for example, identify this as ASCII data. It needs to know that in, when it first hits. So the other side looks at it and goes, I understand ASCII. I can then disentangle this into characters we can understand. Right? A bunch of ones and zeros end up with, you know, uh, four score and seven years, our forefathers brought forth a, you know, new nation conceived in liberty. Right? That's what they do. Session layer. Now we're starting to get towards net towards network stuff. Yeah. Purpose of the session layer is to provide the means necessary for cooperating presentation entities. Lovely, sentence, lovely words. To organize and to synchronize their dialogue and to manage their data exchange. Do the session layer provides services to establish a section conne session connection between two presentation entities to, to support orderly data exchange interactions and to release the connection in an orderly manner. The only function of the session layer for connectionless mode indication is to provide a mapping of transport addresses to session addresses. Hmm. Well, you've got to think about this um, the session side of it. So the application, think of a web server for a second. Um, you really hope your web server isn't sort of serving one person, but serving tens, hundreds, thousands. This thing has value, right? I'm hoping, fa you know, Facebook has like one server and it's one session. It'd be really boring. So here you are, and you have to do a mapping. So I need to control this that, you know, this is my web session, this is your web session, this is somebody else's web session. We're going to lay all that stuff out and provide that interchange. And also, start things, stop things. Okay. Again, there's more detail. If you want to read the ISO doc, it goes into a lot of detail. Yes, this is how the language is. Right. So it can be a little tedious. I, you know, if you're already feeling a little tired, I, if you, if you want to go to sleep, dive into it. If you don't, save it for another time. You know, do it in the morning when you're fresh, you've had your coffee, you know, and you want to like, eh, go, read. Okay, transportation mode. Now, this is the first time we start just to have, instead of having just like a protocol data unit, that data, we actually start having, start changing names when you refer to it, segments. So TCP, UDP segments, transport layer. Um, in the connection mode, transport layer functions may include, and I use TCP an example, as an example of it, mapping transport address onto a network address, multiplexing and then transport connections onto network connections. So I can have, you know, lots of servers. That server sitting on port 80, right? It's got a lot, it, hopefully, like these load balancing um, Facebook that you're watching on, have loads of people all talking to them. Technically, that one can support 65,000 and change of uh, connections network-wise. Can it take the load? God knows. Um, that that at this transport layer. So I'm that server sending something out from port 80 to whatever that random port that you two negotiated. So, you know, 6047, you know, uh, 18231, whatever it is, identifies your particular session. There we go. Um, establishment and release of transport connections. Right. So you think about TCP, sense and act, right? So I send a sync, you reply with an async and acknowledgement, and then we and we I acknowledge your sequence numbers. So I first send this uh, I send that sync request, starting packet numbers, you acknowledge I got that packet, you start your sequence, I acknowledge that. We've done that through a handshake establishment and release transport connections. Hey, hey. And then sequence control of individual connections, right? So we, we order the packets. And then error detection, necessary monitoring and quality of service. Um, so, um, and then error recovery. Remember, UDP doesn't do it, connection less, and then error recovery doesn't do it. It has to be done somewhere else in the stack. The application, we saw in some of these higher levels, yeah, in the end, the application is responsible for this whole detecting errors. Um, in the transport layer, TCP, in the connection mode, 
uh, connection mode, yeah, it's going to sit there and go, uh, yeah, I need you to resend this packet. Segmenting, blocking, and concatenation. Can I fragment? Can I not fragment it? Can I dump a lot of little data into one bigger packet going across? Flow control, right, which you, that's where TCP windowing is, right? So here we go. This is all relates. TCP windowing. That's the idea of how many packets I'm going to take, how much, how big of a burst of data do I send? Can I send reliably? Because the more I can just flip a bunch of packets, the, the more bandwidth I can use. But there are limits. Nobody has endless, there's physical limitations to it. Nobody has endless bandwidth. So at some point, you start to use up your bandwidth and we need to slow you down. So flow control, supervisory functions, expedited transport service data, uh, unit transfer and suspend and resume. You know, can it slow down and pick back up again? Okay. And the connection side, this is UDP, mapping between transport addresses and network addresses. You think about this time, this is where we get the port number, right? So we, when, if you do the packet analyze, you see something going to port 23, you're like, okay, that's TCP traffic. Oh, port 22, oh, that's SSH. Um, you know, we see those well-known ports. We know what this traffic is just right there. Right? And it all has to be mapped. Um, when, um, Yeah, that note is interesting, but I'm not going to spend any time on it. And then error detection and monitoring the quality of service. So think about it. Your voice traffic is UDP. Why? Well, it has to arrive in order. If it doesn't arrive in order, I don't want those other packets. I don't want the missing packets because it can't. It'll cause a lag if I have to wait and then reassemble things. So if you have to wait, if there's if, if this conversation of mine starts to drop a little bit, it's just going to garble it to then like buffer things up and then try and give it to you. No. So you're going to monitor it. And of course, in an internal network where you've properly deployed quality of service, then of course I can prioritize this traffic. Um, you know, give it the low latency queues. And so that quality of service really comes into play. Um, data service, data unit delimiting, and supervisory functions. Okay, there you go. This one's going to be a short talk, I think. I'm okay with that. There's your layer four. Get layer four segment TCP UDP, right? Uh, five session layer. I didn't necessarily have a really good map on that one, but like six ASCII, seven applications, say like a web browser, web server. It's a good place to look. Right. Okay, now we get down to layer three, packet, internet protocol, IP. Routing and relaying, network connections, network connection multiplexing. Notice multiplexing keeps coming up because, you know, serial communications, mainframes. We did do multiplexing somewhere, but that terminal had, was usually serial connected and it had like send and receive, and it, it 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 can do one thing at a time. A terminal can do one thing at a time. On the back end, yeah, the the mainframe is multiplexing, so it's servicing all these different terminal lines, and it's running different programs for the different terminals. Um, in fact, when I my first job out of college, yeah, I worked on a giant mainframe system that you know, in the car rental business and, you know, I'd be returning cars, someone else could be, you know, um, renting something out, uh, maybe someone in the back office is um, entering, you know, a new car into the system, taking ones out of, out of service, running reports, right, so multiplexing. Um, but a serial network connection is multiplex. It doesn't. Second thing, blocking, error detection, error recovery, and those are going to vary a little bit. Right. Sequencing, flow control, um, reset, you certainly see that, uh, connection resets, um, and we do um, have, start seeing some um, problems in a packet capture, see a lot of resets. Um, and then this mapping between network addresses and data link addresses. So a data link address 
So we're talking about in, in what we're used to, MAC addresses. That's physical. That's tied to a device. There is no rhyme or reason why these, how these MAC addresses are sitting. Um, so I buy like a, a catalyst switch, like say 9400, 9410. I put it in somewhere. It's got some MAC addresses that got burned in my Cisco. I'm, I'm guessing they were issued sequentially. I don't necessarily know how they do that. But okay, so they have a bunch of sequential things. It's connected up with some devices. I have a mixture of, say, like um, Cisco APs, uh, HP and Dell computers, um, maybe some Apples in there, um, other vendor devices of various sorts. So, like, they have all these crazy MAC addresses that go all over the place. They're not of the. I'm not buying all these machines off the production line in order and getting these MAC addresses in order. Network address, though, is logical, right? I can't do subnetting. I can't do all these other things uh, logically. Um, I control those addresses. Now, admittedly, with IPv6 and some of the auto uh, ways of, of setting up numbers, the UI64, um, yeah, we're just kind of getting back into the mappings more one-to-one -one between that data link address. And of course, you know, if you remember IPX, um, which Novell loved, um, you know, yeah, we actually use that MAC address for something. We use that for the host ID. But you're going to map between a network address. But still, I mean, there was a, there was a network number that got attached to it. That, that data link address, that MAC address, wasn't the only thing we talked about. It had a network address attached to it. That's how it was routable. Right, um, and so and some network layer management. Um, so we're used to that. That when we talk about layer three route, that's routing. Now, of course, we got into the world now with these um, multi-layer uh, Cisco swi switches, where I can be doing uh, layer two functions and layer three functions. So I can do. Um, I can set up a routed port. I can have a switch virtual interface. So there is overlap. But in, that, in those cases, that switch is doing routing functions, doing layer three functions. Um, if I'm doing exclusively layer two, I can still have a single layer three interface, but that's going to be for management. It's not going to actually do anything, except that's how you access it for management. It doesn't route. It's not part of any of the forwarding decisions. It, it just I log in there and I need to change the VLAN on a port, activate a VLAN, whatever I have to do, that's how I'm going to do it. Everything else is happening in layer two, which we'll get to in a second. Layer three, though, I have now a multi layer switch um, and I'm doing layer three, so I have these switch virtual interfaces. And of course, I have uh, devices on different layer three subnets and they, they communicate, they get routed between the various ports. That's layer three. And that one we're more used to. And then it becomes a packet. It's an IP packet. It's a TCP segment or a UDP segment. It's an IP packet. It inside is the segment. It would be a TCP or UDP. Of course, it could also be GRE. And um, even EIGRP is protocol 88. It's not TCP, not UDP. Or was it 88 or 89? Oops. OK, then we get down to layer two. Data link, um, frame, and we're talking about Ethernet here. And you go, wait, 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 isn't that physical? Sort of, kind of, closely, sort of, but not exactly. Because um, remember, we can have serial things like frame relay, uh, T1s are also layer two. We start breaking it down to something more specific, that's where we're getting into that layer one physical, and we'll talk about that in a second. In connection mode, facilities provide data link layer are um, data link addresses, data link connection, um, service data units, data, uh, endpoint identifiers, error notification. Sure, right? We talk about Ethernet in particular, carrier sense, multi axis collision detection, error notification, collisions, right? And if you do show interface, you're going to see things like runs. Um, late collisions, um, that these things all tell you that error conditions are happening on, on the wire. Quality service parameters, your toss bits, um, and again, resets happening of this as well. Um, connectionless mode, 
data link address, quality service still. But we're still a little abstract here, Ethernet. Right? And think about it for a second, because we're going to physical layer. Now we can talk about things like, oh, am I doing um, 10 gigabit LR um, the, or um, the ZX, the, the super long range um, uh, single mode fiber optic? Are we doing uh, SR multi-mode optics? Are we doing um, copper? Could be category six, category six um, A, category seven, category eight. We have all these different things we can do, and that's the physical layer. This one, so that MAC address is I, I do an ARP request. So going from layer two to layer three, I'm doing that mapping of from a layer three address to a layer two. I send on an ARP who has this IP address. How that actually gets transmitted, if it's optic, it's a bunch of laser pulses. If it's copper, well, I'm sending out different voltages at particular frequencies so that I'm so I'm signaling these are my ones, these are my zeros. Laser on and off, ones and zeros. I'm still abstract from that at this point. I, I'm just going, hey, I have a MAC address. It doesn't matter if it's the category six copper or if it's um, the LR fiber optic, right? That's layer one. Layer one, I said 1,000 base XX. This is a bunch of them, 10 base T. 10. I, they don't seem to ask it anymore. I remember the old tests. I needed to know, like, oh, what was the max distance for 10 base five, which was Metcalf's very, very first piece of Ethernet. Big long piece of coax that you took these things called vampire clamps, and I saw them. I never used them. I actually saw them. I had some in my office in a drawer, found in a drawer, and I took over an office that you literally screwed onto the um, so a pin burrowed in and hit the copper of the core so that I can have um, a physical connection. And then, then I used an, it would use an AUI cable attachment unit interface between that vampire clamp in my system to get on the bus, right? That's so much different than fiber optic, right? Pulled glass, um, some of the things like the LRR, you know, two kilometer range versus 500 meter um, of this fat, thick piece of coax. Um, physical air management, physical connection and deactivate activation deactivation you know what well, link coming up so you know we talk about these things if you've had to do my job for a while you know I started out doing desktop right so my ability way back when was a little limited I can do things like okay I see a link light right blinky light on the back of the on the PC where I plug the Ethernet cable into it well, that told me something. That told me layer one. What did it tell me? Well, we agreed on some electrical properties. So there is the voltages are within certain tolerances. The frequency is within certain tolerance. It says, yeah, I have Ethernet going. We're agreeing. And at that layer are things like, I'm negotiating things like duplex, full or half duplex. Um, I am negotiating speed. Modern ports, boy, back in the day, hey, it was 10, we started with 10 megabits, half duplex. We moved up to up to a gigabit full duplex, and now a Cisco's M gig technology, we can get up to 10 gigs off a piece of copper, given certain distance limitations and cabling quality. So that's that layer one physical. Okay, layer two. Well, Mm, you know, there are things I can look in there, all right? So maybe I put a packet analyzer back in the day with hubs. Well, I plug into the same hub as you. I'm seeing what you see, hopefully. Um, assuming there's not a physical defect somewhere, um, and then I suspect layer one would be a problem on a hub. Now I'll do span ports, right? Pull the data. You can see things like, oh, okay. Um, I can see it arping. I can see the request coming back in. There's a lot we can see and do with that on layer two. Is that kind of thing happening? Layer two, certainly if I'm looking at a packet capture, I should be able to see some layer two. 
if I'm on the right network as other devices, and assuming that the uh, broadcast domain is contiguous, things like I ping uh, another device on my segment, right? So on my subnet, I ping it, it answers. It's all really happening. It's more happening layer two. It's layer three, layer four stuff, like ICMP, but it's happening really in layer two. There's no routed interface in between those MAC addresses. It does the ARP, yes, which is layer three function, and the ARP, um, set, you know, the ARP reply is, uh, I am blah, 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 and it gets the, the MAC off the source of the packet. Okay, it, it works. You know, can it work? It, that tells me something, right? Layer three. Okay, you know, can I ping my gateway? I can't ping my gateway. Either I have the wrong gateway or the gateway is broken. Can I ping beyond my gateway? Pinging with a well-known IP address. And, you know, you want to test it somewhere else, like 8.8.8.8. If I remember, it's Google DNS server. It's one of the well-known internet DNS servers. I think it's Google. I can check if you like. Okay. Well, I want to check somewhere else, make sure it actually is pingable. If it answers... You know, it answers, okay, and now I know layer three is working, right? It can route. It has a route out to the internet. It doesn't necessarily have a, it doesn't have a, necessarily have a specific route or maybe a default route, which pushes it out to the internet edge. And then once it gets into the internet, yeah, um, those big BGP routers understand how to, how to get somewhere, but I can test this, right? Um, and, you know, I, I do certain things. Like if I, um, you say, well, I'm having a layer three problem. I tried ping www.google.com. Right? That could be a name resolution problem, not a layer three problem. If you had the IP ping, whatever it is, 206, whatever it is, great. 180, 197, I don't know what it is. Um, that works? Well, layer three is working, right? Um, layer four. Okay, um, I can go into a Telnet application and say, for example, I can Telnet to an IP port 80 and it sh I should get an answer from the web server. That application um, understands uh, my encoding and should at least, even if it just gives me an error, if I try get such and such, um, that and, and I'll say this, sometimes you want to test things like, say, for example, um, SMTP. You can pull up the RFC, the Internet RFC, around simple mail transport protocol. And you can see what it looks like. You can go in, tell that session. There is some complications with that. But if it's internal and you're normally allowed to get at it, you can sit there and type, you know, mail to this. And you should get certain responses all laid out there. Layer 4. Right, TCP is working. Um, it's got it's got the right port numbers. Right, it's assuming it's not been SSL, but you know, port twenty five for SMTP. You can do these things and and test this thing out. You know, layer four is working, and of course, since there's this dependency from the top down to the very bottom. I, layer four can't work unless layer one is working. Layer four can't work if layer two isn't working. Layer, three, layer four can't work if layer three isn't working. Right? Two doesn't can't work unless one is working. Three can't work unless two and one are working. Four unless three, two, and one, and so on. Right? Um, transport layer, you know, still in that one. Session layer. It gets a little harder sometimes to isolate these for testing, but certain things are, um, I said earlier, some of the things like the encapsulation, hey, if I, if I expand it on both sides of the conversation and the data is the same, not been munged and I can line up the data, it, nah, it's not my problem. Something's going on with your application. It, it, each different layer you can test and you're trying to isolate what the problem is. So is it a bug like in a web server? Is it um, you know is it something like hey DNS is returning bad um, IPs. So at this network 
the packet's going to the wrong place because it's not resolving. The name hasn't been resolved correctly. We have to fix that problem. It sometimes looks worse than it is. Um, and I'll tell you one that was kind of funny on this one because I like telling stories. Um, had a sister company, and I, I wasn't I wasn't on board at the time. This is from my guys when I took over there. Said, "Yeah, these guys sometimes do crazy stuff." So internally, for some reasons of their own, they built on their local DNS servers a DNS for our domain. And it broke their mail routing. Why? Well, this is where you need to understand how things work. With DNS, if I have a local zone file for a domain, so you know xyz.com, if I don't have what you're looking for, I go, it doesn't exist. Unless I'm configured as a secondary, then I'm going to go back to where my primary is. If I'm a secondary to a zone, then yeah, I'm going to try and get from my primary, I, you know, well, what is the MX record for it? In this case, they had no MX records for us because they had a zone, it had no MX records. That was our fault. Uh, we never told them to do that. Just saying. So, you know, as you get to break this stuff down, in that case, you know, one thing you would do would be things like, um, I can try, uh, um, it gets a little interesting. Uh, if I tried, probably if I grab packets off and I try and send a piece of mail, I grab packets, I can start looking at it, and then I can see the whole conversation. I should see, like, uh, um, I might see the DNS requests coming from the mail server. Okay, I'm looking for the MX record for this. If you know what you're doing, you're, you sort of go into, um, you know, you can do NS lookup, um, set query equal MX, um, and then put in the domain, you know, xyz.com. And it comes back and it goes, I don't have any record of that. So in that case, like this IP layer, well, it has nowhere to go because there's no, it, it has, in that case, it doesn't have a name record to then reference back to an IP, which then goes into that whole process of, you know, is it local? Do I need to ARP it directly or do I ARP for the gateway? Do I ARP the gateway and forward it? Not happening because that's where it's breaking. You know, as you look for all this stuff, it wasn't like our, ma our mail server was rejecting their conversations. It never got there. As you want to look through these things, like on a layer one perspective, well, I think we were doing some VPN stuff with them at that point. I'm not quite sure. We did have a relationship with them. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure we did. So, you know, that stuff's working. Okay, well, I have a connection to them. Now what? And you can sort of keep, working your way through. So physical seems okay. Data link seems okay. I'm having a little problems on this layer three thing. But again, that's where I want to start. I, I, I want to take out the problem of DNS versus um, IP. So you can ask me, okay, what's, that? what's the internet IP of your, your mail server? Give it to them. You know, tell that. I don't know. Um, is port 25 open? Yeah, is port 25 is open. Okay. Yeah, it's answering. Okay, that says one, one, two, three, working. Right? Four even, working. Don't want the stack, gotta be something else. And of course, you know, I'm, if I, I'm making, I think I'll for a second. You can still have some underlying issues. It's true. Things can be kind of working. It'll be slow, you know, not a, a complete failure like layer one. Show interface, blah. You start seeing errors. It's kind of working. Um, not long ago where um, I, I'm a little upset at myself for missing this one, but um, we had a duplex mismatch. Um, it was a backup circuit. When backup circuit, we brought the backup circuit live. We're having complaints of slowness, which makes sense because of the duplex mismatch. We were getting collisions. We shouldn't have been. And their side was ha running half duplex. We were fixed at at 100 full. Um, 
on the pro provider side had gone under half because it was auto negotiating since duplex has to be negotiated. Speed on copper does not have to be negotiated. When I'm running 100, um, that the electrical properties get lined up and go, okay, you're doing 100 megabit, you can do 100 megabit, that's cool, we can do 100 megabit. That'll work out, but the, the other part, so, you know, layer there were layer one problems, there were layer two problems, but they kind of worked. But you should see that. There should be indicators, right? Slowness, counters, uh, rolling. Uh, if I'm full duplex, I should never see collisions. And I shouldn't see runs. Something else is going on, okay? So, you know, that's kind of the basic. Here's your seven layers. Go back. There's your mnemonic. All people seem to need data processors. If you don't like mine, go look them up. Go make one up. I mean, I've been in classes like when I took basic electronics, I had to learn color code. You know, I was like one of our extras in high school. Like, make one up. Um, that you got these letters. I had a friend of mine who loved doing that kind of stuff. He also did weird anagrams of things. One of them was really bizarre when these nurses went on strike. He came up with some slogan of theirs, and it was like, interesting brain. So that, that way you can put these together. You can map well, layer six, uh, presentation layer, right, 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 right. Um, session, oh, uh, layer five, procession, right, 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 right. Is, it, is layer three transport or network? Uh, it's network, right? Do this. You're going to sound smarter. You understand documents better. And yeah, you got to have to go through, and eventually you're going to read all this stuff. And you know, okay, and they do. You read RFCs, you read ISO, these ISO documents, you read the IETF stuff, Internet Engineering Task Force. They define it. Sometimes you got to pull a dictionary because there's stuff you, you know you're just it's engineer speak, and you just don't use it, and it's fine. You'll get used to it. Um, it's useful stuff. I mean. Yeah, do I use every day? I, I met a guy, um, old dude, man, he's getting close to retirement. He, he could stick an oscilloscope, which you probably don't even know what an oscilloscope is, um, onto a network and, and see problems. Most of us can't do that. I can't do it. Why can you do that? Well, he understands all the electrical properties of Ethernet. He said, oh, you know this. Frequencies off, voltages are a little are happening. You know, there's some like a ground um, differential that's being carried across. There's great stuff you can do with that. That you know, like, that's really cool because you really understood everything. Okay, basics, seven layers, application. Think of like web servers. Um, that list included these things like security, um, quality service, what we're sharing, what we're who we're sharing with. Right, the application layer. Um, think about it. Uh, I do a lot with electronic health records. Right, that there may be these restrictions that says only these workstations are allowed to access the health record system. We're blocking every other workstation. Why? Because that data is highly confidential, and we don't want anyone who's not authorized getting access to it. I, if you get on a machine that's not supposed to have access to it, we don't want to give you that, give you access. And they can do that. The application layer. Right? Presentation, how do we encode it? How do we make a common way for us to, to um, get down to bits and bytes that we both understand on either end? When they reassemble, you know, the electrical pulses, the optical pulses, on the other side, that it comes up with a bunch of ones and zeros in a way that makes sense to that application. So I can hand it off in a way the application understands. Common language. Right. Session. Um, yeah, I need to, we talk a lot about multiplexing in this case with session, um, synchronizing data exchange um, provides a session connection between two presentation entities. TCP isn't exactly doing that, it, doing a different piece of it. Um, orderly data exchange interactions, releasing the connection. Right, segment, TC, layer four, transport, TCP, UDP, okay? Since and act, it's layer four piece, right? Port numbers, layer four piece. Um, that, sure, segmenting, blocking, concatenation, um, 
this is IP doesn't the IP layer I don't really map an application to anything I may be sending SNMP packets at my mail server I may be sending uh, SMTP packets at a mail server I don't know I have different needs if I'm a if I'm a, a management station actually I may do both I may set, do, do some traffic test they haven't run test traffic um, to gather statistics to say yeah, the mail server is running fine uh, if I have some test suite to do that at the same time I'm doing SNMP because I want to make sure that you know the disk is in full and um, you know, how much memory it's using I'm gather I'm pulling all those data points so at this layer layer four that's where I'm distinguishing all that stuff okay uh, IP routing and when I first got into this business we still actually had these isolated networks we did everything on our own right and then maybe dialed in to go pick up email and stuff like that or do a web browsing you did a modem connection we didn't may have had a particularly for small offices they they were dialing out the things and doing work but they might network share printers to share some files between each other right not layer three it's all layer two they're using things like net buoy net buoys run non-routable protocol um net net bios extended user interface look at the crazy stuff i can remember right layer three routing routing ip ip address right and layer two ethernet um frame relay t1s ds3s all that good stuff layer two here to there right transport well transport's a different layer with data link right mac addresses right arp is that bridge between that layer two layer three mapping a layer three address onto a layer two and layer one physical labor la labor <laughs> thousand base sx you know 10 Ba 10 base uh, you know LX4 or 10 GB base 10 GB LX4 whatever all these different modes optical um, serial copper base Ethernet services physical layer right do I send photons do I send um, ele electrical signals how do I I do this right and there you go so here's your homework always got homework on this one um, what tests are you studying for and I see people do this and I'm gonna I think I've said this before I know, I know I've said it before I've said it to many people um, I was in a meeting a long time ago when MCSE was still a thing and I was one and Donna was one and I think Phil was on his way and you know a lot most of my guys had one or two tests under their belt right and I'm meeting this consultant oh we're MCSEs in training what tests have you passed? None. Shut up. You're an MCP in training, Microsoft Certified Professional. You pass the first test, then you're going to get that, right? Commit to a test. If it's CCENT, CCNA, commit to a test. Pick one, right? You got to start somewhere. You got to commit to something. Well, I don't know. Maybe wireless. Maybe I was going to get my Network Plus, CompTIA, Network Plus. I commit to something, anything. Just do it, right? Subscribe to OSI, think about CCENT, think about something like that, entry level, right? Do you have daily goals? If you're like, well, I need some time to study it, you got to make daily goals. And the daily goal is how you fit this stuff in, right? So if you're not, look, um, I do a lot with Kindle stuff, Kindle measures in percent. So if I, I'm trying to get like one, two percent of the book a day or a sitting, I can get through it. Because now I have my daily goal. I'm a little behind. I'm going to try and work on a little catching up. I don't have daily goals. Tend not to do it. Right? If you're still like, well, you know, and I got nothing better to do. Well, it's never going to happen. Let me clear it. It's never going to happen. Have you signed up for or taken it? Or, or what should we taken? I hate my finding my spelling errors. Uh, gram, gram, grammatical errors. Um, like t signed up for like and paid for or taken a class. Right. The classes help for most people. Some people, not so much. They can do without it. They can like read the book or whatever, or you know, like, read the goals and then do a bunch of googling and or finding stuff on um, out on the web. There's a lot of free stuff. Like I'm, I'm creating free stuff, right? There's a lot of free stuff. How we do it? Okay, you're doing in practice labs. So for now, more than ever, it used to be not so much, but now 
they have these simlets and Cisco does, where I gotta type this command. Um, make uh, HSRP, hot standby router protocol, make it work. Oh, we did OSPF, it's not working right. F type in the commands to make it work. So you need practice labs. You need to be able, you want muscle memory. It's time thing, right? So if I'm like, oh, no, 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 question, no, no, no. okay, I think that's the right one. Oh, question, question. Yeah, real life sometimes. Something's broken, it's a little obscure, you don't do it very much, like some of the virtual wire, or you do, you know, you don't, have, haven't been dealing a lot with DMVPN, and you've got this thing, and it's down, and you're like, okay, uh, you're hitting the question mark a lot. Test is a timed entity, so if you're gonna pass, you need to do it in time. Do your practice labs, right? Have you taken any practice tests? Why do you do that? Well, if you did went through high school, and here in the United States, um, you know, SATs are a big deal. Some states, ACTs, I don't know, but SATs, don't they push you to take the practice SAT, the PSAT in your junior year? Um, you know, I, this was a long time ago, but I, I, I know it's true for my stepdaughter that they had practice tests. They would run you through practice tests. Why? So you get used to the format of how they answer questions, how they ask the questions. Right, what to look for. So you start getting your eye. Oh yeah, it says answer two. I need to go click click because it's got the square boxes and then the round ones, right? Um, you know, it said which of these is not true. So you're like, wait, there's four things. Two of these I know are true. Oh, which? Oh man, it's like with the more true. No, you're looking at the ones not. Now you now you narrow the question down. I know those two are true. Which of those two is the one that's not true, right? So you, have you done it? And have you scheduled your test at a certain point? Obviously, you know, don't buy a, a CCENT book or a CCNA book and then register for the class the next week. That'd be kind of dumb, I think. Even if you're actually really good with a lot of experience, you probably want to go through the material, you know, and do some practice tests, right? But eventually at some point, put stake in the sand, schedule. Okay. Um, I work with a group called Operation Freedom Pause. Yay, guys, go look them up. They're really cool. They're helping vets, um, largely vets with post-traumatic stress, training their service dogs so they can have their life back. That's what they're about, right? The founder, Mary Cortani, great lady, super lady, really. I, I um, God, I probably want to cry because it's like she's just doing such great work. Um, every every day is a training opportunity, right? It's, is her motto with these things because you know you're working with dogs they're they're these real living things they're trying to do their best but the thing is like you're pro most of the time it's more like uh you know um uh, I've, I've done dog training right and i'm being the idiot <laughs> the, the trainer is like giving kind of look at me look and i'm like he's fine i'm the idiot okay in this case everything's a training opportunity so here's a suggestion for you with the Cisco test, you get these uh, dry erase sheets and a dry erase pen. Okay, you start seeing questions that you're like, oh my God, what is this thing? I don't know. You can start jotting notes down. Why? Because the end of this test, it, it, they run up to two hours, it's a long time. You know, okay, there's some questions about frame relay LMIs. I don't remember what they were, but I really didn't know those, particularly if you fail. Well, I can I can look at that list now of all these things I all these notes I jotted down. You can't take it with you. You can't photograph it, right? They're going to make sure they're going to strip you down. You don't have your Apple Watch. You don't have your Fitbit. You don't have um, your phone. You don't have anything to go cheat with. Right? They don't run you through a body scanner, but they close enough. If they catch you with anything, um, you may lose your opportunity to ever certify ever again. So don't do it. But in this case. You know, I can take mental notes, and then I want to do is when I go out to my car, um, have pen and paper, or even if I can just, you know, pull up my phone, turn on the recording function, and say, you know, frame relay LMI extensions. Um, uh, what is it? N uh, network prefix translation v version for IPv6, NPTV6. You know, here's the questions. Here's the kind of questions they ask about NPTV6. Right, I can jot those things down. So then when I get home and I'm kind of kicking the trash can and like crying to the dog and, you know, petting the cat. Oh, it was so terrible. Our tests were so hard. Did, you know, I have this list. So then I start Googling. Okay, you know, frame relay, LMI extension. 
Like, oh yeah, that's what they're asking about. Oh, okay. Because obviously, you know, in real tests, you don't get the media feedback then because you got this one and this one wrong. They say you fail, and here's a breakdown of you know where <laughs> where you suck the most. So, you know, that's my my thing for you. So, you know, you learn about you took some time with me. You le you learned about the OSI model. You know a little bit better. You're probably going to read this. You can go the Wikipedia page is pretty good on it. There are a lot of other resources. Go look them up. Right, train, train, train. Go go take a test. I I get. I was one of those guys who sat around for years. I had my I let my search lap lapse and then. You know, I sat around for years, oh, you know, later, later, later. Finally, I got motivated. I got it done. And right? I'm still working on more. Sky's the limit, buddy. That, you know, you got to do it. And frankly, I got to tell you, you know, the thing is, yeah, the truth is, you see certs, they tend to get to the top of the we'll call you pile. So... Because you got to go through a couple screening layers, right? Oftentimes, like maybe it's an HR person's or sometimes a recruiter or something. Um, I don't even understand these questions. I, I'm going to just write down your answers and send them off to whomever is going to say whether they'll even talk to you. The first, the reason you got the first call is because we saw your resume. You had this and that and the other cert. So that got you the first one. You answer things intelligently. I got to say, you can't just do it and forget it. I know, like, I see some guys, one kid, Posting, he's not even 18. He says he's got a couple of certs. Like he's got, like he just did switch. So he's, you know, two more tests and he's got a CCNP, which is great. He says, I want to do it by my 16th birthday. And I'm like, what? I didn't think you could do that, but uh, whatever. Um, good for him, right? Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of practical experience. I got to imagine because mm, he hasn't been around on the earth all that long, right? Um, so. You can't just sort of like cram it and forget it. And yeah, there's going to be things like to do your CCNP route and switch. You know, maybe you like rip. I'm always like, ugh, rip. Ugh. Yeah, but you're going to run into a temp to test on it again. You got to do rip. Maybe, um, you know, some company decides to ask you rip questions to see if you really know your CCNP to be able to talk intelligently about it. Maybe you don't know the commands like off the top of your head, just totally clean, but you know, I, you know, to be able to say things like, oh yeah, well, well rip v2 introduced classless, right? Rip, original rip is a classful protocol. I, I don't send subnet masks because I didn't expect there to be any. Um, so, you know, RIP has some limited usefulness for a lot of reasons. You got to be able to do this thing, but it, it's going to help you get those those calls, man. You want those calls. The market's so good, get on it. But you don't have all, all, all the time because, you know, the other thing too, if it takes you like three years to pass a single test, well, renewals are coming up. So now you're like, oh, you know, it's going to take my switch next. Now I got to go research on CCNA. Um, yeah, don't do that. You got to work. You got to get moving on it, man. Okay. Thanks for watching. See me whining at you. I'm serious. I, 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 I honestly, I do this because I want people to do good work, right? It's my whole motivation, to be honest, um, is, you know, when I work with really good people, is that hopefully I get to get the really good stuff because I'm not pulled back into doing like real simple stuff. It's like, Okay, you're supposed to be this network engineer three, and like you couldn't notice that the Ethernet was unplugged. Give me a break, right? We're the same grade level, and I'm like, did you check and see if it was plugged in, dude? Um, and hey, we all get to make the mistake once, but you know, if I'm constantly doing that, that's a real problem. I, I want it easier for all of us, and I think. You know, for you, it should be stressed out. I'm like, oh, if I ever lose a job, I'll never get one like it again. Yeah, because sometimes we've promoted sort of on, on seniority, not what everyone else is looking for out in the market. So, you know, the better off you are, the more, you know, you can, and, and it's true sometimes, you all grow a job. So this company just, like, they can't sort of keep challenging you. But you built a really good resume, you've got a good, parcel of certs, you can move into something bigger and better, right? I realize that's not always possible for geograph geographic reasons, but frankly, nowadays, a lot of the stuff, like, hey, can you get this remote-only job? Or, you know, I do 
consulting or training or something, right? Anyway, thanks for watching. This stuff will go up my YouTube channel. Look at the old session, old sessions there. Also on Facebook. Um, you can follow me on Facebook. I don't typically accept friends unless I actually know you or I'm connected to somebody. If there's a we have a relationship, we're the same company, then I do. Um, otherwise, not so much. Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I had this really funny one. I'm accepting a lot of people on Twitter, and you know, I get a DM like from, from hello. Finally, she's like, "Oh, you're a nice looking man." And I'm like, "Yeah, no, thank, thank you." And married, just conversation ended. It was awesome. I'm like, what? Weird people on, well, no, I don't know if it's weird or not, but whatever. Random things on Twitter, like, nah, no thanks. Um, connect me on LinkedIn. I actually like having a diverse group on LinkedIn. Um, you don't see cat videos when I'm on LinkedIn. You know, I'm, I keep that professional. It's not as entertaining. Um, but trying to do some good stuff. Um, I sometimes repost some interesting stuff there. Uh, and of course, it's also linked to my SlideShare account, so you can see the slides for this. And then when I, I'll repost the the slide SlideShare link, so if you want to look at the slides for this, you can. I do as a PDF, so if you download it, I don't send you the PowerPoint. You have to do it on your own. Anyway, um, questions, whatever you can put comments. I look at the comments. Um, if you want to, you can DM me on these different channels and say, hey, can you talk about blah, blah, blah. Um, at some point, I'm going to go do a series on quality of service. Um, there's a lot of stuff I can do. I've been a little more challenged lately because I've been in kind of high gear working on some certs for my own professional and personal development. But, you know, we keep hammering at it. And, you know, I want to provide value. So if you had something that really interests you, um, I'm happy to uh, put that in the, um, the, the lineup. So thanks for watching. Talk to you later.